So every two weeks, you should be getting paid from your job. Maybe you own your own business. So you're going to have a certain amount of expenses versus your income, right? Now, at the end of each two weeks or at the end of every month, you should have more in income than expenses if you're running your financial life correctly, right? And that excess money has two places to go. It can go into stocks over here or it can go into savings or CD accounts, depending upon which way you want this pipe to run the water, right? If I look at myself personally in 2022, it was basically like I had this valve completely cut off over here. So basically no money was going into savings or CD accounts. It was all going over here into stocks. We had countless stocks down 20, 40, 60, 80% during 2022, right? 2023, it was still a very stock heavy year for me overall when it comes to income versus expenses, but we started to funnel some money over there to savings and CD accounts, especially in the back half of 2023. But now things have been completely flipped. And in 2024, I am now funneling small amounts of money over to stocks and I'm funneling larger amounts of money over to savings and CD accounts now at this point in time. So what we're going to address in this video is two core subjects. We're going to talk about why I'm getting cash heavy. I want to explain that in depth in this video here today. I'm going to go through every single point why this is happening. The second thing we're going to discuss is when am I going to go back heavy in stocks again? When will I go heavy? When will I start buying aggressively and say, you know what? I don't want to funnel money to savings in, in, in CD accounts. I want to funnel stock, stock, stock. So we'll speak about that in this video as well here today. You have two options. Option one, you can tap the like button like a little fairy. Okay. If you want to do that, I'm not going to sit here and judge you. You do that. Okay. Or you can freaking Hulk smash it. Okay. You decide what's right for you as long as you do it. Do you want to be a fairy or do you want to be a Hulk? That's your decision, okay? All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. At the end of today's video, if you are looking to apply to join my private group, that will be the pinned comment down there. You can click on that and go ahead and fill out an application and join us in there. Once you join us in there, you will be sent your medal. Your medal oh, it's very nice. Your medal uh, membership cards. And then once you hit six figures plus in your portfolio, we'll go ahead and send you this award over. And once you hit seven figures plus, you can join the seven figure club and we'll send you that guy over there. That's access to all my premium course curriculums, Discord chat, all that good stuff. Okay. Important, extremely important, extremely important before we go any further here. Okay. This video is called Why I'm Cash Heavy, not why you should be cash heavy. And the reason I bring that up is uh, there's a lot of people that watch my channel that are that have less than $100,000 net worth, right? I have people that watch this channel that you have hundreds of thousands, you have millions. I have people that actually watch this out of tens of millions. We got some of those folks in the private group, right? But a lot of you guys, maybe 50% or maybe even a little over 50% of you guys watching this video right now, you have under $100,000 in net worth, right? When you have under $100,000 net worth, you know, you don't have to worry about the type of stuff I'm worried about and the type of stuff in, in how I run my life. So this doesn't mean that you should be cash heavy. This is why I'm cash heavy, right? That's why you're watching this video. Why am I cash heavy? As somebody that's, uh, you know, let's call it still on the come up when it comes to your net worth, you should have emergency cash around and you should always be buying, buying, buying. If I think about myself back when I was wor working at Quick Trip, making, you know, 50K a year or whatever, I was like 90% plus invested all the time, actually 95% plus invested all the time. I had emergency money around. So, you know, if I had an expense here, expense there, freak things happen. I always had some money around, so I didn't have to sell stocks to go ahead and fund that. But the bottom line is I was always like 95% plus invested. Okay. And when you're on the come up with your net worth, it's a whole different story. Okay. You just need to focus on buying, buying, buying. And the rest of it is what the rest of it's going to be. Okay. No, let's go through the, all the different reasons why I'm going cash heavy, okay? So first thing up here is valuations. We're not getting attractive valuations on the stock market at this point in time. The S&P 500 is now trading at a P ratio of, let's call it 23, somewhere around there. A year ago, we were at 17. If we look at the NASDAQ 100, a year ago, 25. Now we're talking like 31 in the NASDAQ 100 in terms of PE ratio. If we look at forward estimates, we're trading like a 27, 28 times NASDAQ uh, forward PE ratio. Now at this point in time, in S&P 500, we're at about 21.5. S&P 500, you're doing like you're getting a good deal if you can get it under 20. Like under 20 is ideal, but there's many time periods in the past where you could get S&P 500 under a 15 forward P. So if you're talking about getting a smoking deal on the S&P 500, that's getting it for under a 15. 
If you can get it between, let's say, call it 15 and 20, you're getting decent. If you're over 20, now you're talking about, oof, you know, you're getting up there a little bit, right? If you ever go over a 25, then you're, you're really high in terms of, you know, what you're paying for valuations out there, right? Now, if we look at kind of where we've been trading at here recently, right? And this is a P ratio. It's over the, the past, basically in, since my lifetime, okay? I went back to like 1989 or so, right? When, when, I, when I was born. So look at this, okay? We really only have a few time periods in my entire lifetime. Not my investing lifetime. I'm talking about since I've been on this planet, okay? We've only had a few time periods ever that have been higher than where we're at. And none of that bodes well, right? This time period right here, this was tech bubble, we were trading higher. So, you know, we don't want to compare ourselves to tech bubble. We know what happened to stocks in that situation, right? The great financial crisis looked off the charts, but that was because companies' earnings got absolutely devastated during the great financial crisis. So it made the short-term P ratio look way out of whack, like it was super high, which it kind of was for a very short amount of time there. And then it came back to reality. And then we were traded at very low ranges for a long time. I mean, look at the, the ranges we were trading at in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, when it came to forward P, I mean, it was smoking deals out there, right? And then the other time period we traded quite a bit higher than here was at the end of 2020 into the beginning of 2021, which was a bubble market, you know, not as severe as a tech bubble, but definitely the craziest I've seen in my investing lifetime when it came to a bubble market, okay? So that's the first reason, just not getting the best, you know, let's call it most attractive pricing out there right now, okay? Reason number two, reason number two is... I have a lot currently invested. I mean, a lot of money. This is a public account alone. There's 2.1 million plus dollars just in a public account. I have other Fidelity accounts. I have the Patreon portfolio. I mean, I have probably, I have probably four or five other portfolios that have five figures or more in them. Okay, so you know, the public account is the account that everybody can see every move I ever make in the public, in the, in the private group, right? They've been able to see every move over the last six, seven years. Now we're at $2.1 million. You know, every single week I make moves in that portfolio there. Everybody's able to see that in my private group. And then I have my Patreon portfolio, which I make moves in every single week. And then I have my other portfolios, right? And so I have a lot invested, a lot invested. And sometimes it makes sense to have some cash around. And if we think back to 2022, and this goes into reason number three, I'm still playing catch up from 2022 because 2022 was so heavy on just buy, 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 that even now in the first half of 2024, I'm still playing catch up from 2022, right? Because I was investing so heavily. If we look at the public account, my big six, right? Three of those positions were built out substantially in 2022 in the first half of 2023. Meta, Amazon, Palantir. Those three specifically, right, were bought extremely heavy. I mean, I'm sure you guys remember the video I put out in, in 2022. It was like either October or November of 2022 when I bought like $77,000 of Meta in like one day or something insane like that, right? Like I was an investing beast in Meta at that particular time. And the same could be said for Amazon, Palantir, you know, in that 2022 to the very beginning of 2023 time frame, right? It was a, it was a time and a place. And so I'm still playing catch up from that. Reason number four is, you know, if we if I take you back to when I first got started in the 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 money game, right, as an adult, this was like 2008, and I got a job, Einstein Bagels, the summer of 2008. My brother got me the hookup job, cleaning dishes and and taking orders at the front at Einstein Bagels, and I made like I don't know, I think it was seven dollars and fifty cents an hour, right, and I had to create a bank account, and so we got this like offer in the mail and uh, it was for like, I think $250 if you set up a bank account with direct deposit. So I went with my mom down to Chase Bank and we went ahead and set myself up a, a bank account, right? And at that time I looked into savings accounts and CD accounts because I had heard a little bit about them. I, I learned a little bit enough to know kind of what a savings account CD account was. And I looked at the rates I could get on that and it was basically nothing. <laughs> it was basically nothing. Like I did the math on it and I was like, geez, if I have money even a substantial amount of money in this CD account and savings account for the next 10 years, it's basically nothing, right? And so that was how I entered the, 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 the money game, right, in 2008. And basically, it was like that for as long as I've been in this game up until really the past, like, year or so. And now, suddenly, we can get 4% plus on savings accounts all over the place, 5% plus on CDs. It's magical. I mean, for somebody like myself, they came into the game and you basically got zero, 
I mean, 4 to 5% is absolutely phenomenal. And so this is one of those rare opportunities that I look out there and I'm like, I can actually get some nice yield on my money, right, while it sits there. Because before, the, the view I always had of cash sitting around is, to give you an example of this, to kind of put it in your mind, is a melting ice cube. Think about a melting ice cube, right? It just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until there's nothing there. And that's the way I've always thought about cash because we know the government is always going to spend money, and some people say print money, like it's nobody's business, right? And so your dollar is just worth less and less and less over time. So if you have your money not yielding anything, it's a melting ice cube. And it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over time, right? Versus if you can actually have it and you can yield 4 or 5% that's risk-free, I mean, now we're talking, right? Now we're talking. Now we can stay above the, the CPI rate. Now we're really talking. Reason number five is real estate related. I'm likely going to buy another property in the next one to two years, okay? So I basically subscribe to the notion that I need to be buying a property every, every three to five years, a new real estate investment property, okay? Um, I need to be buying another property every three to five years. That's the game plan. And that's what I'm trying to execute on. And so naturally, the last property I bought was at the uh, beginning of 2021, right? Well, technically I signed for that uh, before 2021. So it was actually signed in, in 2020. So naturally, in the next one to two years, I need to buy another property if I'm going to stick with my game plan of buying a property every three to five years, right? And so that that's a, you know, money down at the end of the day, right? Now, the problem right now in the very short term is I need inventory. If I look here at my city, Vegas, right, we got like no inventory. I mean, there's inventory, but it's like no inventory, okay? Like these numbers are shockingly low. And so if I can get inventory up over this next one to two years, which I think there's a high probability, inventory will come back substantially over the next 12 to 24 months, then we're talking. Because then, obviously, prices are going to be much more favorable. There's going to be a lot more to pick from out there. Because right now, it is just not ideal. It's not ideal. And you could probably talk to most real estate investors. And they would tell you the same exact thing. It's not a great market to be a real estate investor right now. Because prices are still kind of stubbornly high. And mortgage rates are where they're at, which is not great. And then you got low inventory. It's not an ideal situation. So we need inventory to pick up. And my guess is in the next one, two years, we'll see this number pick up substantially. Okay. Now, reason number six why I'm, you know, kind of cash heavy here is we got Mr. Sticky. Inflation. It's proving so far to be pretty darn sticky. Okay. Which is not what really anybody wanted to see. We wanted to see, you know, Inflation just continue to go down, 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 down. You know, we're, it's looking to me like inflation is being very, very sticky. And that's troublesome, right? And so the reason that's so troublesome is it risks higher for longer, which puts a huge weight on the economy. And it sets us up for potentially a bad recession, okay? A very painful recession. If inflation remains very sticky, the Fed has to remain higher for longer. It's not great. The only people that really benefits are super high net worth individuals that have a lot of cash that can get, you know, 5% on their money setting around risk-free, right? For, for folks like that, it's great. For everybody else, higher interest rates is bad for them. It's very bad for them because you, you want to go buy a house, okay, your mortgage payment's ridiculously high versus what you would have got two or three years ago. Ridiculously high. Not just because the home value's gone up, but because of the mortgage rate, right? Go to buy a car. It's going to be substantially more expensive unless you're buying a Tesla. That was the one uh, you, you, might, you might be able to buy cheaper than it was two, three years ago. But basically, any other car, you're going to pay way more. Credit cards, you're going to pay more now than you were a few years ago. And so the bottom line is the, high, the longer rates are in a higher elevated place, the more it could potentially damage the economy and end up causing a lot of problems for the stock market, right? This is a way I, I do, like, you know, I gave you the little melting ice cube analogy ever, earlier. Here's a little rope one for you. And this is the economy, right? And the longer rates are higher, the more that rope just tears apart, tears apart, tears apart until the two pieces are completely apart. And then the Fed is like, oh my gosh, we went way too far. Oh my gosh, drop rates to zero. Do whatever it takes, backstop this whole situation. And then you got a big mess to clean up if you're the Federal Reserve, right? That's the risk. And it could be a pretty big risk. It could be a pretty big mess for the Federal Reserve to come in and clean up at that point in time. It's, it's ugly, right? So this is the issue we have going on, okay? If we can just kill off inflation, then we're talking. But the problem is it's sticky. 
And commodities are not playing nice right now. Commodities already up 8% plus for the year, right? At this pace, woo, yeah, we're not looking good. Now, the problem with commodities going up is, you know, that's going to cause problems likely 3 to 12 months from now. Commodities don't necessarily cause issues right away when it comes to the consumer feeling it and goods and services inflation. But, but, 3, 6, 9, 12 months from now, it actually starts to bleed into the actual economy, starts to affect the consumer, and they start to feel the effects of commodities going up. The commodities bull cycle actually started in late 2020. Most people didn't start feeling the effects of it until actually late 2021, right? So that just kind of shows you the lag between commodities going up. And I mean, if commodities keep going up, that's going to cause big problems next year, right? Which is, once again, not a good situation. Now, this is why a short-term dip in the financial markets is really needed. We need it because think about it. If let's say the S&P 500 drops 7% over the next, let's just say two months, okay? Commodities are dropping 7%, probably, or more, over the next two months. That will mean there's a lot of fear that crept in the market. People are worried. People are getting concerned. Commodities would likely feel the effects of that. And so there's a pretty high probability that, you know, because the problem is, yeah, you want to have the S&P 500 go up 7 8% here at the start of the year like it's done. It's pulled commodities right with it, which then leads to potential inflation down the, the road here and leads to higher for longer, which is... Once again, a scary situation for the economy. It's very, very dire, right? So this is very important, and this is why you should honestly root for a dip in the financial markets, not just to buy stocks for cheaper. It's also for us to kind of get commodities to chill out. So hopefully commodities is not an issue come the back half of the year, and maybe the Fed can actually start lowering rates without you know a complete crash. Reason number seven has to do with Bitcoin and other things, Okay. Right now, the market is insane risk on, okay? Bitcoin has climbed 167% for six months. Bitcoin is one of the best gauges, in my personal opinion, on if the overall financial markets are feeling very risk on or risk off, right? If we're risk on, you know, Bitcoin's flying. If we're risk off, no one wants a piece of Bitcoin. No one's talking about it. You know, go back. Go back to the back half of 2022. Was anybody talking about Bitcoin? No. Go back to the beginning of 2023. No. Okay, hardly anybody was talking about Bitcoin or cared anything about Bitcoin, right? It's a very different situation today. And it's not just Bitcoins. You may think, well, maybe it's just the Bitcoin ETF and everything that's going on there. No, 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 no. Okay, it's Ethereum. Ethereum's up 128% in the past six months. Meme coins, meme coins are now rolling again. Yeah, you know, we, you would have thought after everything that transpired in 2022, you would have thought meme coins, that would have been it, Right? Like, like, like that would have killed off meme coins forever. No, they're back. Okay. They're back in full force at this point in time. And it's not just in things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, meme coins, where you see this kind of crazy risk on, you know, speculation right now. It's also, it's also in the stock market. Look at this Reddit stock up 92% since last week's IPO. I mean, what? 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 (laughs) This is what we have going on out there. And look at Reddit's financials over the years and tell me those are impressive financials. I'd love to hear that that argument there. Okay. And the stock's up 92% since last week's IPO. (sighs) Scary. T-Man. T-Man. His stock is going soaring. I mean, look at this. It's up 16% today, up another 7%. And, you know, this reminds me a little bit of the AMC GameStop situation back then because none of that was about the business fundamentals, right? It wasn't. It was It was about like, we're going to destroy the shorts and these sorts of things and all that stuff, right? The short squeeze of the century. And that's a lot of what you got come, going on now. Reddit stock is not up 92% since our IPO because of the fundamentals of the company. I can tell you that much. No. It's up that much because people are just looking at it as a way to make money and, you know, Wall Street bets and all that stuff. When it comes to this team man situation, it's political. People want it to succeed because they want a certain individual in office, right? And that's a way of getting a lot of money to that individual. So, and it's also about the short, I mean, from what I heard, there's over 100% short interest in this one, right? And so it's about trying to, you know, get the shorts, the squeeze of the century, all these sorts of things. That has nothing to do with the fundamentals of actually what's underlying there. Believe me, 
This would be like a six cent stock if it was actually about the fundamentals of it. It's about everything but that, right? Krispy Kreme Donuts stock was up nearly 40 percentage points here today. It's up another 5% after hours. And this is because there's basically this announcement that came out around McDonald's is going to have a nationwide rollout selling Krispy Kreme Donuts. I looked more into this, right? And what I saw is they're not even going to start rolling out anything until late this year. So that's like forever for now. So in terms of seeing it in the numbers, you got to wait till 2025. And what I saw, it looked like the nationwide rollout was going to be at, by the end of 2026 they're talking about, right? A lot can change between now and then. I don't know. McDonald's could, you know, say, ah, oh, it's not really working out. We're not going to do it after all. I've seen McDonald's do that with plenty of situations, including they were trying to, you know, they tried out. They were like, oh, yeah, we're going to try out these you know, meatless options for burgers, right? And use, uh, I think they were partnering with Beyond Meat. This is like years ago now at this point in time. And then that just ended up fizzling out. Who's to say this Krispy Kreme situation won't be any different? Maybe this is the same exact situation where all of a sudden it's like everybody gets all excited. But this is what I'm talking about with the risk on market. None of what's going on long-term matters. People, you know, it's a shoot first, ask questions later philosophy in the market right now, right? Who cares? Like, oh, even if we don't see money from this for years from now, we're just buying the stock now because, you know, woo, 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 you know, we're making money here, okay? That's all, that's all these situations are about right now, which is, you know, a little, little scary, right? Now, this is all during a time period when, you know, I have a little conspiracy theory, right? My little conspiracy theory is the Federal Reserve, when they, you know, go, go through a massive rate hike cycle or a rate cut cycle, it's basically a dog whistle to the rich, to do certain things. And it's their way of kind of like saying chill or let's go, let's go, let's go, bye, 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 okay? So the dog whistle here, it actually works perfect. You look at this, look at Fed funds rate over time, right? And you'll see after every single major hike cycle, it was a perfect time that you actually should have chilled out, should have kind of let things play out. And if you were smart, that's what you did. You chilled out a little bit, right? You weren't as, ag as aggressive during that particular time period. You let everybody else play their games that they want to play, but you chilled out. You were looking great very, very shortly after that, okay? And we look back to right here. Fed went through a major hike cycle there, right? And we know what happened there. Then the tech bubble happened, right? And right here, this is before the great financial crisis. Fed went through a massive rate hike cycle, this was kind of like a dog whistle to kind of, you know, chill out, chill out, chill out a little bit. This is not the time to buy. You need to just chill right now, okay? And right here, is this, is this not a dog whistle or what is this, okay? I think this is another, you know, the Fed saying, hey, chill right now. We're not, we're not, we're not buying that heavily right now. Like, you need to chill out. You'll be happy in, you know, a, a bit of time from now, right? And to get the timing perfect is, is a hard thing, but it's basically kind of like, you know, chill right now, okay? And we look at these other time periods after they went through a major cut cycle, that was kind of like a dog whistle to you, hey, it's time to buy, right? You got one right here, you got one right here, right? You got one right here after the GFC. These were all opportune times and then obviously Rona. When they cut those rates like that, it's it's basically, the, you know, the Fed telling the rich, hey, you need to get out there, you need to buy assets right now. Now's the time, okay? And it, it actually works perfectly. It works absolutely perfectly. It's really magical how that happens, right? So the moral of the story there, that's why I'm, you know, cash, going cash heavier and heavier and heavier, right? So the second thing we got to address here is when am I going to go back into buying stocks heavy, right? Because I think that's a fair question. Okay, yeah, I'm getting cash heavier and I might get cash heavier. Um, if we have no correction anytime soon, I'm going to probably get cash heavier and cash heavier in the short term, okay? But with that being said, what will get me to start buying aggressively again? One of three scenarios. If either of these three scenarios play out, you'll start to see me buy aggressively again and putting a lot more money toward stocks than let's say cash and savings. The first scenario is the unemployment recession hits. If then hits, then you'll definitely see me deploy money much heavier. And I know that goes against conventional wisdom because you would say, wait a minute, the unemployment recession hits, that's going to be bad. Well, you need to be buying during a recession. Like it's, you know, it usually pays very handsomely to be a buyer of assets when you're in a recession. Okay. Second thing is, if we get a correction or a crash in the market, right? We get a nice pullback in the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. Okay, then we're talking. And obviously, if we get a crash in the market, then we're talking. I'm going to be buying, 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 right? 
And the third situation is if I'm not able to get 5%-ish on cash as I can right now. Let's say the Fed just all of a sudden cut rates a ton and I'm only able to get 2.5% or 3%. Well, it changes my opinion there, right? Because now it's not nearly as attractive. But when I can get 5% as well, that's, that's, that's pretty good, okay? Now, with that being said, right, I stay buying out there. It's not like I stop buying stocks ever, really. There's opportunities in the market right now. There's several stocks I like. I mean, some of these stocks that come to mind, I mean, I still like PayPal stock a lot. You know, it's gone up quite a bit since the bottom, but I still think PayPal's got a very uh, exciting next couple of years ahead. I, I like SoFi stock here. I like, let me let me think about some others. I like Cheesecake Factory stock here. I like a lot of companies that I feel comfortable with. I like Wynn Resorts here. Like I like a lot of companies that I've seen them go through recessions. I've seen them go through, you know, 2020 and everything that happened there. I've seen them go through inflation. And so there's a, there's definitely a good amount of opportunities out there. I buy every single week and I'm going to be buying this week as well. Actually, I just bought stocks today, literally today. I bought some Nike stock. Nike's another opportunity out there. I bought Nike stock today, right? Was it was it an insanely big buy? No. I got my my nice sweet meta dividend today, and that meta dividend came in and it went right out to Nike stock immediately, right? But it wasn't like I funneled ninety thousand dollars to go buy meta stock here today, right? Or to buy Nike stock here today, right? So I'll be buying this week. I'm just um, not buying as heavy as I would in some sort of crash scenario, okay? And so yeah. That's why I'm at where I'm at, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm set up pretty dang good. I'm set up pretty good, guys, okay? Appreciate you joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here, folks. If you want to learn from me on the deepest level possible, click the pinned comment down there, apply to join my private group. If you like videos like this, you're going to love the private group because I put out a lot of videos like this. Of course, curriculums loaded with just gems, dropping information on you, different ways to look at the market, uh, you know, how to understand if stocks are a great deal, if you're getting ripped off on a stock understanding financial statements on a high level, being able to look at a company like some of these companies going public and be like, that's crap that will end up crashing heavily as in like 80, 90% in the next situation we have whenever that happens, whether that's three months, six months, nine months, 12 months from now, some of these companies going IPO are going to crash 80, 90, 100% and people are running into these stocks buying them and they don't realize really what's going on with the financials. So if you want to understand all this stuff that's very important to your money long-term, you know, Apply to join my private group, pin comment down there, and we'll get you up to a much higher level, okay? Much love and have a great day.